A long time ago there was a special village nestled around green hills and lush meadows. The village was called Maroon, however it had a more popular name it was known by other villages. Other villagers called it the village of blessed twins. This was because hundreds of years ago, the gods blessed the village that if any woman gives birth to twins, the twins would be specific and divinely gifted. Due to this blessing pronounced by the gods, it made the village of Wudu to be known far and wide. Anytime a woman gave birth to twins in the land, the village would be in a huge celebration. Even the king would attend the ceremony and give gifts of gold, beads and other treasures to the family in order to take care of the twins. This was a tradition and also the kings knew that once the twins come of age, they will bring even greater glory back to the village. However, despite all this, twins in Maroon village were rare and hard to come by. Many women who got pregnant in the village would always pray to the gods to give them the gift of twins in order for their life to change. Admit this, there were two women in the village who were friends. Their names were Ada and Lila. Both of the women were friends from a young age and had grown up together. However, when they got to the age of marriage, Lila got more suitors than Ada and she eventually got married. Lila got married to a wealthy man who was from a wealthy family. As soon as this happened, her behavior towards Ada changed. She stopped being friends with her and the competitiveness that they had turned dark. Lila began to move with new friends and they would laugh at Ada because she was poor and unmarried. Ada would secretly cry alone inside her heart. Since she no longer had her parents, there was not really anyone she could talk to. As time passed, Ada fell in love and married a rich man called Yuzo. She was finally happy that Lila and her new friends would no longer be able to laugh at her anymore. However, after a year that Ada got married to her husband, an incident happened that made him become poor. This happened after he suffered a disaster that destroyed his farmlands. As Ada's husband was no longer rich, she could no longer go to the market to buy the expensive things she once used to. When in the market, she would try to hide or cover her head in shame because she knew that those who once knew her to be rich and fancy would see her. Her former friend Lila once saw her in the market. She and her friends began to laugh at the new kind of clothes that she was wearing. Owing to this Ada vowed that she would get back at Lila. As life would have it, Lila got pregnant for her husband. When it was time to deliver her baby, it came as a shock as Lila gave birth to twins. Two beautiful boys. The whole village was joyous. Celebration was all over the streets. The old women in their wrappers danced and danced. Even little children who had no idea what was really happening was joyous. News flew across other villages that a woman had given birth to twins. In no time, the news also reached Ada. Ada was shocked after hearing the news. She felt bad asking why only good things happened to Lila despite her character and all the bad things she had done to her. How would the gods bless Lila with twins when Lila was always making fun of her and tormenting her? Ada was devastated. She knew now that there was nothing more she could do that would matter. Even if miraculously her husband became rich again, it could never compare to the glory that Lila now had. In her mind, her enemy has now found a new way to mock her and she was not going to have it. Ada made up her mind too that she too must have a set of twins on her own. Ada then began to save up some money. 
she had heard of a powerful priestess in a far away village who had a solution to almost every problem. Ada began to save some money in order to travel and meet the priestess. She decided that she was no longer going to live a miserable life and she would finally give Lila, her friend now turned enemy, the shock of her life. Ada traveled to the distant village crossing many rivers and many forests. She lied to her husband that she was going to see a distant relative that she had. She knew that was the only way her husband would let her travel. When Ada got to the distant village, she asked for directions in order to find the priestess. When she got to the shrine of the powerful priestess she explained her plight and said what she desired. The priestess explained to Ada that only the gods had the power to predetermine the children a woman would she have. She further told Ada that she should be patient and that the gods may eventually reward her with the twins she wanted. Ada begged the priestess saying that she did not want to leave anything to chance. She begged that the priestess should find a way to help her. The priestess then gave a bunch of colonauts. She told Ada to eat them once every seven days until she took in and that she would give birth to twins. However, she explained that there may be consequences for deciding to go through the path that she was taking. Ada thanked the priestess and took the colonauts. She said that no matter what happens she would bear the consequences if any should follow. Ada returned back to her village with joy in her heart. She believed she was going to give birth to twins. She followed the instructions the priestess gave her. She said in her mind that she was finally going to prove to those who laughed at her, especially Lila that was not just the wife of a poor farmer. After some months, Lila became pregnant. In the meantime, Lila who was still enjoying the gifts and attention got because she had given birth to twins did not know that something terrible was about to happen. It was months after she had given birth, her twins developed a terrible illness and died. That month was a dark month for the village. Many of the villagers came to offer their condolences to Lila and some even tried to comfort her. When Ada heard the news she didn't know how to feel. However she knew that despite all the things that Lila had done to her, her babies were not a part of it and were actually innocent. In truth, she felt bad about the children. However she too was pregnant. So she decided to make sure that she followed the priestess instructions. In just about a few months later, Eddie gave birth to her own set of twins. It felt like an impossible feat the whole village jubilated. A lot of persons were very happy. Some persons said that because Yudan lost her twins. The gods decided to bless them again by giving twins to Ada. As per the normal tradition, villagers brought gift to Ada. The king just as it was required of him by tradition brought gift of gold. Ada was so joyous. Her wish had finally come to pass. However she didn't know that things would turn out to be bad for her later. Ada children turned out to be two beautiful identical girls. They were the talk of the whole village for a long time. Ada named them Amora and Zora. Due to her blessings, everyone now wanted to be Ada's friend. However the feeling was different for Ada because Yudin after losing her twins babies began to live a quiet life and no longer made trouble with anyone. Ada also never tried to make Yudin look bad for losing her twins. She just enjoyed the gifts and blessings that came from her twin girls. It didn't take long, time passed. Amora and Zora were two wonderful twins. They loved each other and did everything together. 
One of the things they loved doing was going to the stream together to fetch water for their parents. Amora who was the older twin loved her sister so much. She would tell her sister, Zara, beautiful stories and sing her beautiful songs till she fell asleep. As times passed, the identical twin sisters grew and became very beautiful. It was at this time that their gifts began to manifest. Amora and Zora were extremely good at making beautiful clothes with wonderful designs and colors. They were in there across the lands and all the villages. It didn't take long, important, rich and powerful people from all over the villages would line up in front of Ada's house so that they could purchase the beautiful and adorned clothes that her twin daughters had made. Even the kings in other villages noticed the gods giving talent that Zora and Amora possessed. They became the talk of many villages. As time passed, however, people began to notice that the clothes that Amora made were more beautiful and colorful than her twin. Zora. This soon became news across many villages. It didn't take long, the villages began to notice that Amora and Zora were not equally gifted. As a result of this, many of the villagers in other villages did not want to buy the clothes made by Zora. This realization made Zora to feel bad and insecure. She would hold her clothing and sometimes cry alone inside her room. When Amora noticed that her sister was not happy, she started to look for ways that she would use to cheer her up. One time, in an entire month, Amora pretended to be seriously sick. She did this so that when people came to buy clothes from their house, they would have no choice but to buy the clothes Zora had made. This made Zora to be happy. Just like that, things continued to go good for the twin sisters until something more surprising and different happened. The village decided to hold a festival. In the festival, Zara told Amora that they should have fun and dance and play with the villagers. This was because Zara was feeling more excited than usual. Owing to her sister's request, Amora decided to participate in the festival by playing the local drum with the villagers. What she did not know however was that playing the drum would change her life forever. When Amora began to beat the drum, the beat was so melodious and captivating that the villagers stopped to wonder. Their mouths were wide open. Amora played the drum in such an extraordinary way that it felt as though the god of music had possessed Amora and was playing the drum instead. Everywhere was filled with excitement and the festival became even more interesting. Soon, it became clear that Amora was a gifted drummer. This realization changed everything. Kings of other villages began to request for Amora whenever they had a special occasion or festival to celebrate. When Zara saw her sister new gift, she was very amazed. She felt that she too would possess the extraordinary gift to beat the drum like her sister. However, she was wrong. Zara would beat the drum inside her room but the sound was far from extraordinary. It was nothing like that of her twin sister. She would feel sad and after a while try again. Day after day, she would try to play the drum like her sister but it never worked. Zara sometimes would even go into the forest to try and beat the drum. This was because she didn't want anyone to see or hear her practicing. She knew they would laugh at her or taunt her for trying too hard to be like her sister, Amora. As Amora drumming gift began to gain more popularity, she began to leave home more often. This was because other villages were always inviting her for special occasions. 
Amara would always beg Zora to accompany her to the village she was going because she loved her sister and didn't want to be alone. She also did not want her sister to be alone at home by herself with just their mother. Zora, on the other hand, would always refuse to go. She felt she would be a burden to Amora and also she didn't want to be laughed at or mocked by others. She felt she would be of no use at all to sister. One time as Amara left to another village just like she normally did, Zora went into the forest to practice her drum. However this particular day was different. As she was playing her drum, an old strange looking woman walked up to her. The old woman came to her and told her that she lived nearby. She then told Zora that she had been watching her cry time and time again because she could not play the drum like her sister. I'm going to help you. The old woman said. The old woman then gave Zora a special drum and told her to take it home. She told her that at night when everyone was asleep, she should beat the drum three times. The old woman said that after she did that, she would be able to play any drum she touched just like her twin sister. Zara was very happy to hear this, she wasted no time in running home. The thought of her playing the drum like her sister clouded her mind to think properly. She wasn't even concerned about who the old woman was or how she got the mysterious drum. At night, when everyone was asleep, Zara brought out the drum and did as the old woman instructed. However, as she did this, an evil spirit awakened behind her. The ominous being entered into Zara and suddenly Zara fell to the floor. The next day, Zara woke up without remembering what happened to her and she even forgot that she had gone into the forest the previous day. She also had no recollection of the old woman that gave her a mysterious drum. That same day, Amora returned from the village she had gone to play for. She also brought a gift for Zora and her mother, Ada. Ada who had already gotten used to a luxurious life took the gift in happiness. That night, as the family slept, the evil inside Zora began to manifest, she awoke all of a sudden. Her eyes were red as blood. Zora then went outside and suddenly transformed into a dark creature. In the form of the creature, Zora went on a rampage in the village, killing the livestock of various farmers in the village. She also had an acidious vapor breath. With this she was able to make the plants in the villagers farm wither and die. After she had done this, she transformed back into her human form and went back to sleep in her bed. The next day, the village was awoken to a shock. They saw their plants and crops destroyed and their livestock dead. It was a total disaster. The villagers cried to the king, begging. The king then, after hearing the plea from the villagers, devised a plan to get rid of anything that was causing the disaster. The king then called a very powerful warrior in the land that was also a medicine man. The warrior's name was Akin. The king then tasked Akin to do all in his power to catch whatsoever was causing the disaster. The king told Akin that since he was a medicine man even though the threat was not a natural threat but that of a spiritual one, he would be able to handle the task. Akin was happy that the king gave him such an important task. He told the king that he would not sleep in the night but would patrol the village should in case danger arose. That night, the evil that possessed Zora awoke again. Zora awoke and was ready to carry out her evil deed. However, a sudden strong breeze that blew through the window awoke Amora. As Amora awoke, 
she was shocked to find out that her sister had changed. Her eyes were red and she was totally different. She screamed out of fear. Her scream woke up their mother, Ada. Ada was shocked to see what Sarah had become. She wanted to scream but nothing came from her mouth. Zara wanted to begin her transformation to a monster. However her mother, Ada, went close to her in an attempt to see what had truly become of her child. Zara's finger turned into claws and she pierced in into her mother's stomach. Blood spilled out. The scene was so terrifying that it made Amora to scream for the second time. Amora rushed and held her bleeding mother in her arm in tears. She was terrified of what had just transpired. She screamed for help. In the meantime, Zara jumped through the window and transformed into a beast like she did the previous night. As she was about to run and cause havoc in the village, Akin saw her. Akin who had heard the scream of Amora had traced the voice down to their place. Akin then fired two powerful arrows at Zora who was now an evil creature. Zora suddenly fell down injured and weak. What do you think will become the fate of Zora, Amora and their mother who was almost lifeless on the ground? Will the king kill Zora for what she did to their village? Or will something more strange occur? Find out in the next part. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Till we meet again. Akin had fired his arrows and it pierced Zora who had initially turned into a beast. However because Akin arrows had a powerful charm on it, it made Zora to return to her human form. She was however unconscious. Akin decided to walk close to her and that was when he realized that the creature he had initially shot was Zora. Meanwhile, the scream of Amora had wakened some of the villagers who were her neighbors. Luckily for Amora, one of the skilled healers of the village lived close by. As soon as she heard the scream, she rushed to Ada hut and saw her bleeding. She quickly went out to carry some herbs to treat Ada and stop her from bleeding. She then consoled Amora and told her to stop crying. Some persons who had woken up were shocked about what had happened. It didn't take long. Soon it was morning. At this time, almost all of the villagers had heard what had happened. They were aware that Zora was the one who was terrorizing their farm animals and destroying their crops at night. Zara was placed inside a cell inside the king's palace. The people of the village gathered at the front of the king's palace for a solution. The king then asked Akin if he would be able to help Zara return back to normal by using his powerful charms and medicines. Akin confessed telling the king that the evil at play inside Zara was the work of powerful witchcraft and that it was beyond his powers and understanding. As soon as he finished, some villagers then began to shout that if Zora could not be cured, she should be killed. However, some other villagers began to chant that Akin should find a way to help her. This was said mostly by those who loved the twins. As all of this was going on, Amara was just by the side in tears, not knowing what to do or say. She just watched as she saw the village trying to decide the fate of her twin sister, Zara. The king ordered the people of the village to be quiet. The king then reminded the people who were saying that Zora should be killed that Zora and Amora were blessed twins and were gifts from the gods and must be dealt with using wisdom. As the king said this, Akin then told the king that he could make a powerful charm that would make Zora to be unconscious. He explained that in this unconscious state, she would not be able to turn evil at night. 
However, the medicine would only last for three days, and after three days, Zora would return back to her evil ways. As soon as the king heard this, he told the villagers that they should carry about their daily lives that they would be safe for the next three nights. He reassured them that before the end of the three nights, they would have found a permanent solution to Zora's problem. After hearing this, the villagers left the palace and went on about their daily lives. Amora, Akin and Amora then held a meeting inside the king's palace on how they can help Zora. At the end of the conversation, it was concluded the best person that could really help Zora was someone referred to as the White Priest. The White Priest was also referred to as the Eyes of the Gods. The king told Amara that the white priest knows all that has happened in the past and even sees the present. The only limitation of his power was his ability to see the future. The king explained that the gods did not give the white priest the ability to see the future. Amara listened in and was baffled. She didn't know that such a person existed. She then asked how will she be able to locate the white priest. The king told Amara that locating the white priest was not a problem. He mentioned that a lot of persons in many villages knew where the white priest dwelt. The real problem and obstacle is Kidu. Kidu is the reason why people are terrified to look for the white priest. The king explained. He further explained that hundreds of years ago, when the gods granted the, the white priest his powers, people started to seek the white priest for selfish reasons. They asked him of the location of hidden treasures and other things that were not of virtue. As a result of this, the god sent Kidu, a powerful guardian, to block the path that led to the white priest. Akin then told Amara that Kidu had the power to look into a person's soul to see if their quest was noble. If it decides that the person was not noble, it could kill the person instantly. Amara was terrified of this knowledge that she had just acquired. However, Amara loved her sister so much. She knew she must try everything within her power to help her. The king told Amara that long ago, a king great-grandfather had gone to meet the white priest to gain knowledge about medicines and charms so he could help people by healing and protecting them. He further said that Akin's great-grand is the only person from their village that has gone and returned alive. Amara told the that she would seek out the white priest. The king told Akin to accompany and guide Amora in her journey. He reminded them that since the charm on Zora would wear off after three days, they should do their best to return on time. Amora and Zora then made preparation to go meet the white priest. Before they left Amora thanked Akin for deciding to help her and her sisters. Akin told Amara not to mention it, that it was because of situations like this that made his great-grandfather to look for the white priest. Ever since then his family had been making sure that they protected the village. After carrying the necessary items, Akin and Amara journeyed into the forest that led to the white priest. On their way, after walking for a long time, Amara was surprised that the forest was calm and they were not experiencing any danger of threat. Akin then told Amara that it was as a result of Kidu. He explained that other creatures were afraid of Kidu and because of that they cannot be in the same forest where he dwelled. Amara sighed and said nothing more. After a short while, they arrived at a place. Suddenly the ground began to shake and trees began to fall. Amora then saw the guardian that protected the path to the white priest, Kidu. Kidu was a gigantic serpent of terror. 
it was even bigger than what the king had described. Amora was paralyzed out of fear. She however managed to speak, while trembling. I'm a blessed twin from the gods, I have come to help my sister. She said in a stammering voice. The giant snake looked at Amora and Akin and all of a sudden something strange happened. Kidi began to reduce in size. It shrinked all the way to a small snake and laid fully on the ground. All of a sudden it then turned into stone. Amara was surprised. Akin then told Amara that Kidu had given them the go-ahead to meet the white priest. In that moment, Amara wasted no time. She and Akin then walked past and soon arrived inside the temple of the white priest. The eyes of the gods. When Amara saw the white priest she wanted to speak but the eyes of the gods told her that he knew why she came. My child, time is not in your hands, so I will tell you what you need to know. The eyes of the gods said. Amara listened attentively. The white priest told Amara that a powerful witch was the one that spelled Zara. Her twin sister. He explained that the witch was part of their village long ago but the former king, who was now late, banished her because she went about performing rituals on women and collecting money while promising them the gift of twins. After her banishment, she swore that she would get revenge on the village. The priest then explained that the witch used Zora as a way to exact her revenge on the village. The white priest gave Zora a white arrow. He told her that the arrow had to be shot at the witch. He said that once this is done, the judgment of the gods would fall on the witch. He then also gave her a mystical bead. The bead was meant to guide her to find the evil witch hut inside the forest. Akin and Amora thanked the white priest and left the shrine. As they came out, Amora noticed that Kidu, the great guardian serpent, was still laid down and in stone. Akin then told Amora that according to the story that was passed down from his great-grandfather, Kidu, the giant guardian serpent did not shrink in size or bow to the ground. He explained that Kidu only turned into stone while maintaining its gigantic form. Amora out of curiosity then asked why their encounter was different. Akin then replied saying Kidu must have realized that she is a blessed twin from the gods and that that was the only reasonable explanation. Amora took Akin words as a sign of relief. She believed somehow the gods will make her mission fruitful. After working for long hours, Amora and Akin got to a place and Akin realized that he could not go further. However from where they were standing, they could see the evil which is hot. Akin then told Amora that she has to go alone. He explained that the witch had cast a spell around the vicinity of her hut and only a woman can pass it. Since he was a man, he would not be able to pass. But I've never shot an arrow before, how will I do it? Akin then told Amara that the white priest had already known that this would happen, so he must originally intended Amara to be the one to use the arrow instead. Amara took Akin's arrow, she then went close to the hut. Strangely, she found that the old witch was sleeping inside. Amara felt so angry that the witch was sleeping peacefully after plotting evil using her twin sister. Nevertheless, she shot the arrow. She misfired but however the arrow guided itself and pierced the witch. Amora then left and went to meet Akin. All of a sudden as Ella looked back, she saw that the witch's heart was burning. The gods had casted their judgment. The day soon became dark. Akin and Amora then decided to rest and sleep.
I can use this protective charm to make sure that no harm would befall them as they slept. The next morning, Akin and Amora went back to meet the white priest. Amora was ready for the second task. The white priest explained to Amora even though Zora was no longer possessed, there was still a darkness inside her because she was not as gifted as she. He told Amora that her mother, Ada had gone to meet a priestess to give birth to twins however the gods had already decided that Ada initially was going to get twins on her own. He explained that her mother mistake was what made Zora to not be fully gifted. He added that all gifted twins were equally gifted. What one could do, the other could do equally as well. However, because of their mother's impatience, Zara was born different. Zara would always feel incomplete and would have a darkness inside her unless she is just like Amora. This was how the gods designed it. Amora then asked the white priest how would she be able to make things right. The eyes of the gods told Amora that she must go into the sacred forest and appease the gods in the divine tree. The white priest said that if she is lucky, the gods would forgive her and restore balance to she and Zora. Amora thanked the white priest and headed for the sacred forest. Akin decided to wait for her as he knew that she had to go alone for this particular task. When Amora located the divine tree, she prayed asking the gods to grant her audience. After waiting for a long while, thunder struck and a face appeared in the shape of flickering fire. Amara bowed her head. Why have you come here? You are not the one to appease us. The god spoke in a loud thundering voice. Amara replied saying that she came to ask for mercy on behalf of her mother. The gods told Amara that that her mother was destined for twins but she had defied herself by meeting someone else to grant her wish. This is why I've come to ask for mercy. Amara said still bowing. The gods told Amara that punishment cannot be averted. They told her that soon her mother would become blind and would stay that way for 10 years. After 10 years, she would regain her sight again. Amora could not bear the thought of her mother losing her eyes. She asked the gods if there was a way she could avert her mother's punishment. The gods told Amora that the only way to do so was for her to give up her gift. The gods told her that she would no longer have any gifts. The gods asked Amora to pick between the two punishments. With tears in her eyes, Amora told the gods to remove her gifts and spare her mother. The gods then told Amora to return back to the village. Go, your sister Zara has been restored. And your mother has been forgiven. The gods said as the flame disappeared. Amora stayed in the forest and began to cry. As soon as the gods disappeared, she could feel that something has left her. She could tell that she was no longer gifted. After crying for a while, Amora consoled herself by remembering that Zora would still have her gifts and that her mother would not go blind. The next day, Akin and Amora arrived at the village. Amora told the king everything that happened. At this time, Ada, Zora, and Amora's mother had been healed of her wound. The king also released Zora since she was no longer a threat to the village. Ada and Zora heard what happened to Amora and the sacrifice she paid in the divine forest and also how she passed through Keda to meet the white priest. Ada hugged her two daughters in tears as she apologized to them for what she put them through. She vowed that henceforth, she'll strive to become a better mother to them. Zora also apologized for the trouble she made Amora go through. 
Due to the incident that occurred in the forest, Amora then resorted to farming and hard labor as she was no longer gifted like she was before. Her twin sister Zora, as a way to honor the sacrifice Amora made for she and her mother also joined her in her farming activities. As for their mother Ada, apart from joining them to farm, she would go to the divine forest on a daily basis to thank the gods and ask for their mercy on her family. This became the daily life of Ada and her twin daughters. One year passed and it was time to celebrate a massive festival in the village. Ada told her daughters that they should go to the village and celebrate with the village. During the celebration, something marvelously strange happened. The sky began to change color. All of a sudden, a drum started to gently come down in a beam of white light towards the point where Amora was dancing. Amara was surprised. However, the villagers knew this was a sign of the gods. As the drum got to Amara's hands, the beam of light disappeared. Everyone froze and nobody moved. Amara took a deep breath and hit the drum. In that moment, she could tell that she had regained her godly gifts back again. She then began to play the drum like she used to, to everyone surprised. The villagers began to dance in celebration. The gods had heard their plea and restored Amora's gift. Zora could not contain her joy. She went to grab a drum and also began to play alongside her sister. The festival was the best festival that the village had celebrated. The blessed twins Amora and Zora played melodious beats and sound in majestic glory of the gods. The synchrony of their sounds could not be explained in words. Everyone rejoiced that everything in the village was at peace and balance. And so this ends the beautiful tale of Amora and Zora. Please like, subscribe and share for more beautiful stories. A long time ago, there lived a married couple in the village of Oaken. The couple lived a simple life and were known for their good heart and kindness. The man, Akin, was a farmer. His beloved wife Beauty was a trader who sold in the market. The couple were happy together but they had no child. However, they believed that one day the gods would hear their prayers and grant them a child. As time passed, Beauty got pregnant and bore the most beautiful baby girl. Her mother named her Ella. Ella was so beautiful that everyone in the village admired her. As Ella grew up she became even more beautiful. Her parents showered her with love and care. They made sure to teach her how to be hardworking, polite and respectful to her elders. However, the most tragic thing that could happen to any child happened to Ella. One unfortunate day, Ella's parents got sick and both of them died. Ella was left alone, heartbroken and devastated by her parents' passing. She cried for days upon days but there was nothing she could do to turn back the hands of time. Ella then went on to live with her grandmother. Ella then grew to become a very beautiful lady. However, despite her beauty, she never allowed it get to her head. She was still hardworking as she had always been. Due to her kindness and hardworking nature, the village people loved her. Ella, owing to the tragedy of her parents, only managed to have two close friends. Akin and Bisola. Bisola was Ella's best friend and had known her since they were both children. Ella's mother was a friend of Bisola's mother before she died. As time passed, Bisola also lost her mom. Her father then remarried to another woman called Tosin. 
After both losing their mom, Ella and Bisola were inseparable. Despite their tragedy, Ella and Bisola found peace with each other as friends. Ella also taught Bisola how to weave. She had learned the art from her mother and grandmother and had perfected it so well that the villagers acknowledged her for it. However a few villagers especially the women were jealous that Ella was too beautiful and much more gifted than their daughters and children. One of such persons who nursed such thoughts towards Ella was Bisola's stepmother, Tosin. One morning, Tosin called Bisola, her stepdaughter, to talk to her. She advised her that she should stop moving with her friend Ella. Bisola was a bit confused and asked why. Tosin then told her stepdaughter that Ella was always coming out first in everything they did, while she was always coming out as the second best. She told Bisola that if she wants to become the best, she needs to stop moving around with Ella. Bisola then told her stepmother that she would think about what she'd said. However deep within Bisola, she knew that nothing was going to make her stop her friendship with Ella. However, she was not sure what her stepmother was trying to gain by separating them. However what Bisola did not understand was simple. Her stepmother Tosin did not have a child of her own. So she wanted to make sure that all the glory in the village comes to Bisola. That way, they would indirectly come to her. If she could make sure that her stepdaughter became the center of attraction in the village, all the favor meeting Ella would come to her. A few weeks later, the village was holding a competition for the young maidens in the village. The competition was to showcase the beautiful and artistic works of the beautiful women in the village and their weaving prowess. Since most of the girls were aware that Ella could weave, they always tried to put in their best in order to come out at the top. However Ella always ended up coming out as the first. Since Ella taught Bisola, Bisola would always take second place. That day, Bisola decided to go visit her friend Ella. Her stepmother then called her and gave her a bowl of food to give to Ella and her grandmother. Tosin told Bisola that since Ella's grandmother was sick and Ella was the one taking care of her, she wanted to do something nice for them. Tosin however emphasized that Bisola should not mix up the food stating that the food for Ella should not be eaten by her grandmother and vice versa. Bisola agreed and then stepped out of the house. As soon as she came out, she saw Akin. Akin was a funny, handsome young man who had been close to Ella and Bisola at a young age. His parents died few months after his birth so he never knew them. However his grandfather took care of him and raised him to be good and responsible. His grandfather was also a medicine man and so Akin learned the art from him. As Akin met up with Bisola, both friends began to laugh and gist. Soon they got to Ella's house. Bisola and Akin asked Ella about her grandmother. She then told Ella that her stepmother had prepared food for her and her grandmother. Ella then told Bisola that she and her grandmother had already eaten and she wanted to go to the competition ground early. Akin then cut in and stated that he was hungry but he didn't want to be rude since the food wasn't meant for him. Bisola then had no choice but to give Akin the food. Akin then told them that after eating he would come over to meet them at the competition ground. At the competition, all the ladies did their best and presented their works. However like most people knew already, Ella came out first position. 
Bisola came out second while the rest of the girls got other positions. The village elder then came and gave the winning prize to Ella. Bisola was happy and so was Ella, the villagers in the background were also excited. There was just one last competition remaining and it was the final competition. The winner of the final competition would be given a gift from the king and the prince in the village. Ella, Bisola and the girl who took the third position were all anticipating the final competition. Meanwhile, among the village crowd, Ella noticed that Akin was nowhere to be found. Later that evening, when Bisola and Ella got to Ella's house, they saw that Akin was asleep with the empty football beside him. Ella's grandmother then told them that Akin had been asleep for hours. She stated that as soon as he ate the food, he fell to the ground asleep. Bisola and Ella tapped Akin several times, hitting him hard. Eventually they even had to pour water on his face before he eventually woke up. After his awake, Akin apologized for missing their competition, stating that he didn't know how and when he fell asleep. Ella told Akin not to worry and told him and Bisola that they should return home as the day had already gotten dark. So, the two friends then left Ella's house. When Bisola arrived home, her stepmother told her that she heard that Ella was the one who won the competition. She then asked if she had given Ella the food that she had prepared. Bisola then explained everything that happened with the food. How Akin ate the food because Ella and her grandmother had already eaten when she got there. Bisola's stepmother, Tosin said nothing after hearing Bisola words. She just went to eat and then went to sleep. That night, Bisola then pondered the whole situation that occurred. She then realized that her stepmother was trying to disqualify Ella from the competition. If Ella had eaten the food and had not come, she would have been disqualified and she would not have been able to compete in the final competition. Owing to this, Bisola then decided that she would no longer underestimate her stepmother again. The next day, Ella prepared food and served her grandmother. Her grandmother thanked her and told her that she was a blessing and she was proud to have her as a granddaughter. She also said that wherever her parents were she knew they would also be proud. Ella smiled with contentment. However the next words her grandmother said was what then changed everything. Her grandmother told Ella that she should stop using her money to buy medicine since it was extremely expensive. She emphasized that because she was using the money she got from her weaving competitions to buy medicine, she had been unable to save money for herself. Ella's grandmother stated that she was old and had lived her life and that she doesn't wasn't want Ella to use all her money. Strength and time to take care of her at the expense of her youth. My child, you are young and beautiful. I am old and may join my ancestors soon. I don't you to carry my burden. Ella's grandmother said. Ella was not happy with what her grandmother told her. She became very sad instantly. She begged her grandmother to finish her food. Ella then went to the nearby forest to cry. Ella was crying because she had lost her mother and father so young due to an illness. As a result, she was extremely terrified of losing her grandmother. She didn't want to be alone in the world with no family to talk to or relate to. Ella cried for such a long time that her eyes slowly began to turn red. 
She was so carried away by her thoughts that she was unaware that someone was approaching her from behind. The person was Akin. Akin was shocked to see that Ella was crying uncontrollably. He spoke to her and comforted her. Akin had gone to pick some herbs inside the forest for his grandfather. After Ella opened up to Akin about why she was crying, Akin told her that everything would be fine. He promised her that whatsoever happened he would be there for her. He also reminded her that Bisola was also her friend and together they would protect her against anything. Ella was reassured by Akin's words, she then wiped her tears and stood up. Akin then escorted her home, telling her to rest and sleep well. Later that evening, when Akin got home, he was greatly disturbed by the fact that he saw Ella crying. Akin begged his grandfather that he wanted to have a conversation with him. Akin told his grandfather about Ella's grandmother condition and asked if they would be able to help her. Akin's grandfather explained to Akin that he was familiar with Ella's grandmother condition and that he could make the expensive medical Ella was always using her hard earned money to buy. However he stated that he lacked two essential ingredients, dragon leaves and moon roots. He emphasized that these ingredients were extremely hard to find and that was why the medicine was expensive to even buy. Akin asked his grandfather where he could get the ingredients. His grandfather told him that as far as he remembered they could be gotten in the forest in a faraway village. To get to the village, someone would have to cross three rivers. Akin then begged his grandfather that he wanted to go. His grandfather permitted him but begged him to be very careful. The next morning, Akin journeyed out of the village to look for the special medicinal ingredients for Ella's grandmother. After crossing the rivers he made mention of he finally arrived at the forest. It took him three days to get there. Akin then took his time to look for the herbs and when he found it, he journeyed back to his village. The day after Akin arrived, he went to meet Ella in the morning to give her the herbs he and his grandfather had made. The medicine he brought would last Ella's grandmother for three months. Ella was so happy and couldn't contain her joy with tears in her eyes. She hugged Akin, holding him dearly. Akin was happy that Ella would no longer have to use her money to take care of her mother. She would finally be able to plan for herself also. It was just remaining a few days before the final weaving competition in the village. In the meantime, Bisola's stepmother, Tosin was nursing an evil plan to get rid of Ella once and for all. She then went to meet an evil native priest so that she could charm Ella. The native priest gave Tosin a white ash powder and told her to pour it on Ella. He told her that once she had done that, she just needed to look at Ella and say any animal that comes to her mind, immediately Ella would transform to that animal. After hearing this, Tosin was satisfied. On the day of the final competition, Tosin knew that Ella would like to go to the competition early. That morning, she gave Bisola a lot of work to do, so she wouldn't be able to go to Ella's house. Bisola then walked past the road where Ella was following to go early to the competition. As she crossed past Ella, she made sure to pour a little portion of the white ash without Ella realizing. As soon as her mission was successful, she then went back home. Later, during the festival when everyone had gathered, Tosin decided to show up. As soon as the competition was about to begin, Tosin looked towards Ella and mentioned Snake. Immediately, the one beautiful, 
adored girl Ella turned into a snake. All of a sudden the whole place was scattered. Everyone began to run out of fear. Bisola had the shock of her life as she saw what happened. What do you think will be Ella's fate in this story? Find out in the next part. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Till we meet again. The villagers ran Hella Skelter Alpha Webressing what had just happened to Ella. Bisola personally was shocked and did not believe what had just happened to her friend. It didn't take long, some villagers gathered around to tell the king what had transpired. Meanwhile, when Bisola got home, she was still in shock. Her stepmother, Tosin then spoke to her. I have always told you that there was something about your friend. I didn't even know that she was a witch. Tosin said. My friend is not a witch, I have known her my whole life. Bisola said. She was almost about to cry. She ran out of the hut and sat outside crying. In the meantime, Tosin came outside and told Bisola that she wanted to buy some ingredients in the market to cook her favorite meal. Bisola was unhappy something unpleasant had just happened to her friend but all her stepmother could talk about was food. It didn't take long, John came to meet Bisola at home. She met Bisola crying outside her hut. John explained to Bisola that she needed to stop crying and they need to work to help Ella. I just can't imagine why something like that would happen to her. Bisola said. John replied telling Bisola that there were many people who did not like Ella in the village and that someone must have bewitched Ella. John then told Bisola something that shocked her the more. He told her that while he was out getting herbs for his grandfather some days back in the evening, he saw a figure passing through the forest going to the path of Modera. The evil priest. He told Bisola that whatever charm was used on Ella, he was certain it was from Modera. So what do we do now? Bisola asked. What of Ella's grandmother? She could die of shock if she hears the news. Bisola said, almost to burst into tears. Don't worry, I have a plan, John replied. John explained to Bisola that he can make a concoction that could make Ella's grandmother asleep for three days. He explained that during that time they must find a way to help Ella and restore her back to her human form. We cannot trust anyone. John said. We have to do this by ourselves, John said. In the meantime, John went home and prepared the concoction for Ella's grandmother. Later, he took the concoction there. He then told Ella's grandmother that Ella was on her way but had sent him and Bisola to bring the herbal drink for her. Ella's grandmother who was unaware of the calamity that had befallen her granddaughter drank the drink and after a minute, she fell asleep like a baby. Later, John then told Bisola the second part of his plan. He told Bisola that they needed to go into the forest and meet Modera. The evil priest. He explained that Bisola would pretend that she came to ask for a solution to a problem. She would say she wanted to turn someone into an animal and see what Modera would tell her to do. You know I would do anything just to help Ella. But what if the priest sees through me and defect that I'm lying? What will we do then? Bisola asked. Don't worry about that, my grandfather will help us. John replied. There's one more problem, Bisola said. 
She then told him that she doesn't trust her stepmother and that she would need a lie to get her out of the house. John then told Bisola to tell her stepmother Tosin that she wanted to go look after Ella's grandmother for the night. You are right. That is the perfect excuse. Bisola said. Thank you, John. I wouldn't have been able to help Ella all by myself, she added. We are in this together. I love you both and I know either of you would do the same for me. John replied. That evening, when Bisola's stepmom returned home, Bisola followed John's plan and told her that she wanted to go look after Ella's grandmother. Tosin knew that helping Ella's grandmother would not change Ella's fate, so she allowed her to go. As soon as Tosin left the house, Bisola went to John's house. John's grandfather then spoke to Bisola. He gave her a medicine to chew before leaving. He told her that Modera will not be able to detect the truth from lies once they spoke. Bisola thanked John's grandfather. Later at night, she and John went into the forest to meet Modera. When Bisola got to the place, she was scared at first but then summoned courage. Once she was inside the hut, Bisola spoke to Modera asking him for the charm to make someone to turn into an animal. Modera brought her the same charm he had given to her stepmother. Modera explained to Bisola that once she places it on her target, she needs to speak the name of the animal. Her target would then turn into the animal. Bisola then asked if it was possible to reverse the effect. Modera told Bisola that if she pulls the power back on the animal, the person would change back. He however told her that if she needed to change the person she used the powder on, she must do it in three days unless the effect would be permanent. Bisola thanked Modera, the evil priest and dropped the items as her form of payment. After Bisola left the shrine, she met John in the middle of the forest, she explained to John everything that Modera, the evil priest told her. John then took the powder from Bisola. Together both of them journeyed back into the village. Bisola then went to Ella's grandmother hut while John returned home. The next morning, Bisola woke up and went home. Getting home, she realized that her stepmother Tosin was not home. Something then began to trouble her. She knew that her stepmother didn't like Ella. However, she wasn't sure if her stepmother had the mind to go so far as changing her best friend into an animal. There was only one way to find out. Bisola began to scatter the house in search. She wanted to be sure if her stepmother was the one who had done something to Ella or if she was guilty free. After a long while of searching, Bisola discovered where her stepmother, Tosin had hidden the powder. As she saw this, she quickly ran to meet John and explain what she had seen. John was actually surprised at what he had heard. He said he would not have guessed that Bisola's stepmother was the one behind Ella's demise. This changed everything, John said to Bisola. Now that we know this, we must act a bit faster, as Bisola and John were still having their conversation, Bisola noticed a group of villagers patrolling the village. John then told Bisola that the king had ordered a search party to see if they could look for Ella. He explained that the king did not believe that Ella was a witch and wanted to help her but they needed to find her first. 
Bisola then told John that Ella as a snake would not be hiding inside the village. There is a spot Ella always goes to cry in the forest. I'm thinking she may be hiding there John decided to see if Bisola's assumption would be true. They both then went into the forest getting to the spot John and Bisola began looking at the ground to see if they would see Ella. John warned Bisola to be careful for other snakes on the ground. After a while of searching, Bisola noticed the tail of a snake that was hiding under a rock. She called the attention of John who quickly walked towards where Bisola stood. John decided to see if Bisola's thoughts were true. He took from the powder that Madeira gave Bisola and poured it on the snake. Behold! Like a shock, the snake transformed and revealed Ella. Bisola cried tears of joy as she hugged Ella. John also joined in the hug. I'm so thankful that we found you. We thought we would not be able to see you again. Bisola cried tears of joy Bisola then explained to Ella what had transpired and how she and John had gone through a lot to help her. John then told Ella and Bisola that Ella would need to hide until night time before going home because of the villagers in the village. He told them that once they had told the king what had happened in the morning, they would be able to settle everything. At night, Ella covered hid herself as she entered into her hut. However, Bisola's stepmother saw her entering the hut. She recognized that it was Ella because Ella was putting on the same clothes that she had on during the competition. Tosin was very confused. She could not sleep properly at night. She began to wonder if the power that the priest gave her was ineffective. There was only one way to find out. In the morning, Tosin stepped out of the house to go meet the priest. In the meantime, Bisola sensed that something wasn't right because Tosin usually does not wake up very early to go to the market or go anywhere in particular. Bisola then knew that she needed to act fast. She rushed to tell John that she was sure her stepmother must have known that Ella was somehow fine and she was back in the village. John and Bisola then went to meet the king to tell the king everything. At first, the king found it hard to believe them, however, the king decided to send his most trusted bodyguard, Monsal to see if they have restored her back to her human form. The guard after following Bisola and John confirmed that truly, Ella was restored and fine. The king then decided to listen properly to John and Bisola. John explained that Tosin was headed to meet the priest who helped her to turn Ella into a snake. He however explained that he knew a shortcut. The king however told them that going was not necessary, he opened up that he had a secret pool where he could could watch someone providing he had something that belonged to the person. The king told Bisola to go bring something that belonged to her stepmother. He however warned her that if her stepmother was innocent and was found doing nothing evil, she and John would be locked up in the palace prison. Bisola did as the king commanded and went to bring something that belonged to her stepmother. The king then called his palace priest. The palace priest then dipped the item that Bisola brought into the special pool. After they did this, they then saw Bisola and the Madura, the evil priest. The king and a few others who had gathered were able to hear the conversation that Tosin was having with the evil priest, Madura. This time, Tosin asked Madura to give her a powder that would make Ella to run mad. She said she did not want Ella to escape from this predicament. 
the king and his subjects watched this and that was how the king realized that John and Bisola was telling the truth. Later, as Tosin was returning back to the village, the king palace guards apprehended her and told her to come to the palace. Before now, the king had already sent a message to the villagers to come to the palace to witness judgment. The king asked Tosin if she was responsible for what happened to Ella. Tosin lied saying she was not the one. However, Tosin was with the powder that Madure gave her. When questioned about the powder, Tosin lied that the powder had no effect and that it was completely harmless. The king then told Tosin to pour it on herself. However Tosin was reluctant to do so. The king then told her that everyone was already aware of what she did. He then told her that she will be imprisoned all the days of her life for the evil she committed to Ella. And that was how Bisola was punished. Everyone in the village watched as this happened. The next day, Ella's grandmother woke up and Ella hugged her tightly in her arms. She told her grandmother everything and how her friends helped and rescued her. The king also decided to reward John and Bisola for their bravery and courage. Also for the bond of friendship they shared with Ella that made them to risk their lives to save her. The king rewarded each of them with gold. The gold was more than what each of them could spend in their lifetime. The villagers learned a huge lesson from Ella's story. They also remembered from time to time that Tosin was now locked in prison, never to come out again. And so, Ella, Bisola and John continued to their life in the village, living happily one day after another. We have come to the end of this tale. Please like and subscribe, till we meet again.